good morning. How's everybody doing today? You guys stay with us. Let's sing this song. We learned it last week. It's called I Raise a Hallelujah.
Amen. A few of you probably know, I think probably most of you know, next week is Easter. Easter of Coolidge, yes. So um, my prayer for myself and for all of us this morning is that even in these moments, we will begin to focus on inviting our friends, our co-workers, family members, whoever it may be. And uh, we mentioned it last week. We have more this week. We have these cards, Easter at Coolidge. The back says EasterCoolidge.com. We have a whole bunch of these that you can take with you when you leave. Uh, hand them out as flyers. Uh, if you, you have a, a place where people come and go a lot, you can set those on a desk, maybe at your office. Uh, hand them out in your neighborhood. Some folks mentioned that this morning. I mentioned last week we can print off some flyers. If your place of employment will allow you to put those up, we can get those for you as well. But as we, as we move towards Easter, as we move towards what they call the Holy Week, Today is Palm Sunday. This is the day that Jesus rode into town and the crowd was chanting Hosanna. But by the end of the week, the crowd was saying, crucify him. So as we just sang, as we just sang talking about being in the middle of a storm, Jesus was there. He experienced what we often experience. So as I said, just begin to move your heart towards inviting folks to Easter. And these are some good ways you can do that we can get you other tools, but let's pray this morning. Father, we come to you this morning. We, we thank you that we have reason to celebrate. We have hope. We have we have you. Father, and as we go through this week, even this morning, I pray that you will begin to encourage us because of what you have done for us to tell anybody and everybody we can about you. A great first step in that may be to invite them to Easter at Coolidge where they'll come and they'll hear a sermon. So Father, this morning I pray for Easter at Coolidge. I pray for this week. I pray for all of us here that will invite people to the park. Father, and I pray even this morning for the people who are maybe right now having a conversation about a long weekend, so taking the family out of town, going somewhere different. They may be on the internet right now searching for hotels and cities they've never been to, and so Father, I pray that you will draw them to Chattanooga. I pray that you will draw them to the park. Father, the people that have no intention of coming to an Easter service, but they're going to ride their bike on Sunday morning, or they're going to go for a jog on Sunday morning. Father, I pray that you will begin to move in their lives so that they are where they need to be to hear about you and about your son and what he has done for each and every one of us. Father, we give you this time, we give you this week, we give you next Sunday. Father, we pray that you will be glorified, that we will move and act in a way that will lift you up and that will please you. And Father, we pray that this morning that you will begin to move our hearts in that direction, that you will begin to show us what it is that we specifically need to do to glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing together this morning about the living hope. Oh, mm-hmm. 
for your goodness. We thank you for your care. We thank you for your provisions. Father, we have 
have so much to be thankful for. Father, we thank you for this week where you displayed that love for us, where you made it abundantly clear to us how much you loved us. And while we celebrate the birth of our Savior at Christmas time, Father, this week is where it all comes to fruition. This is the week that we have that gives us that hope where our penalty was paid, a penalty that we could not pay on our own. And so, Father, we thank you. Father, I pray that this week we will sing of your goodness, that we will pray out of your goodness, and that we will tell others about your goodness. Father, I pray that you be with Brian as he comes this morning. Lord, just speak through him. Empower him. Father, we thank you for him. We thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take a few moments, shake hands with those around you as we continue to worship. Well, let me invite you to take your Bible and open to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. As we continue in our series uh, that we've been saying is rapidly approaching Easter, but we're, we're essentially here. Uh, it's coming in uh, just a few days, and we are excited about the opportunity that we're going to have to uh, worship together and to invite our community, our friends to come and to be with us that day, and I appreciate so much Patrick praying uh, under the sovereignty of God to bring people to our city uh, that they might uh, think they're coming just for a vacation or a time away uh, or to see a city they've never seen, but uh, under God's providence to come and to hear the good news of the gospel and uh, to have the opportunity to repent of sin and receive the gift of eternal life through salvation by faith in Jesus, and we're excited about the opportunity. I know that many of you have signed up and volunteered to, vol uh, to, to serve that day in a variety of capacities, and we're thankful for that. We've got another training coming this afternoon for those who weren't able to come to the one a couple weeks ago. And uh, how many of you uh, stayed last Sunday and stuffed Easter eggs? Thank you so much for staying and, and, and serving and working diligently and because you might be thinking in the monotony of, of how many creative ways can you stuff an Easter egg. And, and the, the never-ending debate of which one is the top and which one is the bottom. Uh, I've just stopped calling top and bottom. I just say pointy and roundy because the, 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 ar the argument's unending. But you might think in the midst of about the thousandth egg you feel like you've stuffed of, of what is the point of this. And, and we don't do an egg hunt uh, just so we can have one and just so we can give children candy. And we don't paint faces just to give people a creative uh, outlet and those kind of things. We do those kind of things uh, as an invitation for our community to come and enjoy some time together to give them the opportunity to hear the good news about Jesus. Uh, so it's, it's not trivial. Uh, it may be mundane. It may be uh, repetitive, but it is purposeful and it is strategic. And we're thankful that you took part in that. And so uh, we're, we're looking forward to the opportunities that we're praying in faith God is going to give us next week to tell our friends about Christ. So hopefully you've already been praying for them and, and you may take some of those cards that Patrick mentioned earlier and take those and use those as invitation tools this week to give to people, uh, to invite, to come to the park next Sunday to celebrate the risen Savior. We're excited about uh, the opportunity that we're going to have and not just to invite but also to pray for our friends. And I'm letting you know now, at the end of our service this morning, that's what we're going to be calling uh, ourselves to this morning, 
is to a particular time of prayer. We're going to do our invitation a little differently this morning. I'm actually going to be calling you to come forward. We're going to pray together over a variety of things dealing with Easter at Coolidge. And so I hope that you'll participate in that time. We're going to, I'm just, I like to give you a heads up because we're Baptist and we know, we know what's coming. Uh, but, but if there's going to be a change, I want to give you a little bit of warning. You know, we're going to do the invitation a little differently today, uh, and we're looking forward to that time. But in John chapter 17, we have this beautiful, beautiful, intimate moment recorded and preserved for us. And I'm so thankful that God gave us chapter 17 as God inspired his servant to write and record these words that he has recorded them for us and preserved them for us because in chapter 17 we hear Jesus praying. We're told numerous times throughout the Gospels where Jesus, as was his custom, would go off to a place by himself to pray. And we see that uh, as, as a repetitive thing, as a part of the normal exercise of Jesus' day, prayer was a vital part, but we're not given a lot of insight into what he prayed, except for a few particular times. But, but in John chapter 17, we're invited into a very intimate moment in conversation between the Father and the Son. And very, very often we call this Jesus' high priestly prayer. And we're going to take this this morning, and, and it's, it's, it's impossible for us to do a thorough examination in one time uh, in this text. So we're going to look at sort of a broad picture and pull some principles that we can see from it, because we could realistically spend six or eight or ten weeks just in this one chapter. Uh, but this morning we're going to receive some encouragement of some of the principles that we see here as, as we are invited to come and to pray with him. And so I hope you've got your bulletin uh, with you. There's an outline that's provided for you there to sort of give some structure as we move ahead. But if you look in John chapter 17, I'm going to begin reading in verse 1, and, and we'll walk our way through most of the text this morning, uh, stopping at a few points to, to be encouraged. So in John chapter 17, verse 1, the Bible says, These things Jesus spoke, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Now, let's not read too quickly this morning. I want us to, to catch the weight of what Jesus says here. The hour has come. Numerous times in the Gospels, Jesus talks about, and the Gospel writers say, that his hour had not yet come. Now, Jesus is making a grand proclamation here of Jesus praying for this hour. Because this hour was set out before time. We have every reason to believe from the, the text of Scripture that God had put into place a preordained plan to bring about the redemption of the world through the sacrifice of His Son. That's why Jesus says several times in the New Testament that his hour had not yet come. And, and, and we see him saying that in particular places and, and it's a bit confusing if you try to take it out of the, the context of this larger plan. We see some illustrations of that as, as we recognize God's preordained plan from before the foundation of the world to bring about the redemption of sinful humanity through the completed work of atonement in His Son. And so we see about Jesus praying for this hour we can recognize that in places like Acts chapter 2, verse 23. There are going to be some passages on the scripture for you, or on the passage of scripture on the, the screen for you. So I want you to look in Acts chapter 2. As Peter preaches on, in, on Pentecost, He says, men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. This man delivered up by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. You nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. And God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. 
Isn't that a grand proclamation? Peter encapsulates the good news of the gospel in two or three verses here as he's proclaiming the good news to people immediately after the ascension of Jesus and as we see the Holy Spirit fall on the disciples and Jesus proclaims the good news and we're going to see in this moment thousands of people profess faith in Jesus. But he makes a point to declare what Jesus has done and how it fits in the grander narrative of Scripture that even prior to the foundation of the world, in this preordained plan in the foreknowledge of God, that Jesus didn't accidentally go to the cross. Jesus didn't stumble into a bad situation from which he couldn't extricate himself. He was absolutely purposeful and according to God's perfect, preordained, predetermined before the foundations of the world were laid plan to accomplish the salvation of sinful humanity through the death of his son. But not merely just through his death, but also ultimately through his resurrection that he proclaims victory over the grave death and the hell through Jesus' resurrection. And this was not accidental. The cross wasn't because Jesus caught a bad break. But rather, it was the foreordained plan of God that the person of God is seen in Jesus' divinity. This understanding of the, the pre-incarnate Jesus, that Jesus didn't just show up on, on the scene and then become the Son of God. Jesus didn't become divine at his baptism as some people would try to espouse. But the scriptures proclaim the reality that Jesus is divine and Jesus proclaimed that about himself when he made statements like, I and the Father are one. But we see this personhood of God uh, in Jesus, in his divinity, but also through the, the execution of the plan of God through his humanity. A couple of verses I want to show you. Look in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 20, and then also in Revelation chapter 13. 1 Peter chapter 1 says, For He, Jesus, indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world. Well, I want us to go back and look in that context for just a moment. Look in, in 1 Peter chapter 1. Go ahead and turn there in your Bible. Peter writing of the redemption of mankind in chapter 1. In verse 17, he says, If you address the, uh, as Father the one who impartially judges according to each man's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay upon the earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your feudal way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but he has appeared in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. He didn't just show up and suddenly become known. Or rather, he is divine. He is eternal. Look in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. So we have this, this picture into, into eternity in this description of Jesus. It says, all who dwell on the earth will worship him, everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the, uh, in the, the world, in the book of life, the lamb who has been slain. We, we see this, this reality of the, of the eternality of Christ all the way from Genesis, where the Scripture tells us that, that the counsel of God says, let us make man in our own image. There is, this, there is this, this reality of the relational nature of God within himself in the Trinity, then all the way to the end of the book. This, this overarching 
plan of God's saving work through Jesus. And so that's what Jesus is talking about when he says in chapter 17, verse 1, Father, the hour has come. This thing for which you sent me, the time for it has now arrived. Because we see this, this plan that was in existence before time, but we also see it in the midst of the time of Jesus' ministry on earth. Several times we're told that, that his time had not yet come. If you, if you look back in John chapter 2, look back in John chapter 2. In the context of Jesus' first miracle that's recorded for us, it says, And on the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And Jesus also was invited and his disciples to the wedding. And when the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. This is one of those places that I wish I could hear voice inflection in the written word. Or maybe to see a gesture. Because clearly, by the way that Jesus responds, Mary's not merely giving Jesus information that he probably could have observed being in the context, but it, it, it's like it almost comes with a nod or, or a wink or a... They, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, and I believe voice inflection would be important here as well. And some cultural understanding. Because as Southerners, we think this is not the way you talk to your mama. But that's not the culture. That's not the context. We can't take our immediate context and put it here and think Jesus is somehow being rude to his mom. But it, it is almost as if he's saying, woman... Not in a derogatory or pejorative kind of way. What do, what, what do I have to do with you? My hour has not yet come. Because several times throughout the Gospels, people try to push Jesus ahead of the timetable of God for their own agenda. We have other places recorded in, in John in chapter 7, verse 30, in chapter 8, where either the writer of the gospel or Jesus says it of himself that his hour had not yet come because my time has not yet come. Because all of the things proclaimed about the Messiah had to be accomplished in order for Jesus to go to the cross and fulfill all that was necessary for our salvation. That's why you see it throughout the, the Gospels and specifically in the last day of Jesus' life, even into and post-crucifixion, where it says things like this, that Jesus said these things so that all the things written about the Messiah would, would be fulfilled. Or this was done so that all the things proclaimed about him would be fulfilled. Even after Jesus dies on the cross. There are things that are done and not done to fulfill all the things that were proclaimed about the Messiah. So when Jesus talks about in these things, my hour has not yet come, my hour has not yet come, he's saying all the things that need to be fulfilled so that I can come to that time must be done. So, so basically saying don't rush me. There are still things I need to do. But now he comes into this moment and says, the hour has come. This is, this is here. Glorify thy son, that the son may glorify thee. Even as thou hast given him authority over all mankind, that to all whom thou hast given him, he may give eternal life. I want you to catch the weight of what Jesus is talking about here. He's not merely talking about a, a, a series of chronological events. 
He's recognizing and proclaiming in the company of the hearing of his disciples what this hour means. And he's inviting the Father in, in this relational nature to glorify thy Son, that the Son may glorify thee. And you think, well, well what? This, this relational nature of the Trinity and this chorus of, of one glorifying the other. In this reality that those who the Father has given him, that the Son may give them eternal life. And this is the eternal life, that they may know thee, the one only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I glorify thee on the earth, having accomplished the work which thou hast given me to do. Referring to what he just said in, in verse 1, that the hour has come because he's accomplished all the things. And now glorify thou me together with thyself, Father, with the glory with which I had with thee before the world was. So here even Jesus makes a, re a reference to his pre-creation existence. And I don't mean his creation, I mean pre-Genesis 1, creation of everything else existence. So in this ministry of Jesus... We see him talking about this reality that he has come to glorify the Father. He has come to make the Father known. We have little reminders of this as Jesus engages with people, and especially here in these last few moments with his disciples, when the disciples are gloriously confused about what Jesus is talking about, and because he's talked about being with them and then not being with them any longer, and some things are going to happen that are going to be wonderfully confusing, and, and they're not going to respond well, and all of those kind of things. And, and it, one part in the, in the engagement, that Jesus is talking about going to a place where they can't come now, but that he would come to them, and, and basically they say, okay, Show us the Father, and, and, and we'll get it. And Jesus says, if I've been with you so long that you still say, show me the Father. He says, I and the Father are one. Everything that Jesus has been doing has been to glorify the Father and to show them the Father, to make the Father known. And in making him known, he's also bringing them grace. And that he may give eternal life that is by grace through faith in Jesus. So the ministry of, of Jesus is to make known the Father and the, the, the gift of grace through faith in Christ. We also see this not near, merely as his ministry but also his mission. First of that in, ch in chapter, or excuse me, in, in verse 3. And Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Jesus makes that proclamation several times in, in the Gospels. And here, a reminder that he knows the purpose for why he was sent. To secure eternal life by paying the sin debt for all of mankind. To secure eternal life by paying the sin debt for all of mankind. So Jesus is engaging the Father here about the hour. And Jesus knows what's coming. We're going to have a, another bit of insight into part of the prayer of Jesus when he goes to the garden and he prays that if there's any other way that this could be accomplished, then, then let's do that. But not my will, but what? Yours be done. So Jesus knows the mission on which he is sent. He knows the cost that the completion of that mission will require. But he also knows the re eternal reality of what that mission will accomplish, which is the redemption of man. So he prays for the hour. But even in the praying for the hour, he prays for his disciples. Because he's talking about those that the Father's given him, and he's referring specifically in this moment not, not just to, we're going to, he's going to talk about those who will believe later, but he's also dealing with those who have followed him most closely. So he prays for his disciples in this context. And he says, I manifested uh, thy name to the men whom thou gavest me of the world, and they, 
Thine they were, and thou gave them to me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have come to know everything that thou hast given me is from thee. For the words which you gave me, I have given to them, and they received them, and they truly understood that I came forth from you. And they believed that you did send me. I ask on their behalf, I do not ask on behalf of the world, but on those whom you have given me, for they are yours, and all things that are mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. He's rec recognizing before the Father that those who had believed his word of the proclamation of who he is and that they, are, that they belong to the Father. He's recognizing the work that God has done in them. But he's not merely going to recognize the work that God has done and the word that they have believed, but he's also going to pray very specific things for them. He says, I am, uh, in verse 11, and I am no more in the world, and yet they, yet they themselves are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep them in thy name, the name which thou hast given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. So as Jesus prays for his disciples, he prays for their unity. I want, I want to catch the intensity of the statement that Jesus makes and the weight of this oneness. That they may be one even as we are one. There is no separation. There is no deviation. There is no, no disconnection in the Trinity. And, and Jesus is not praying that we would be crammed together in some kind of weird mashup. So, so don't take the, the, the nature of the Trinity and the exact nature of the way that we relate to one another as followers of Jesus, but the intensity of what Jesus is saying, that, that there is no disharmony, there is no separation, there is no disconnection in the nature of the Trinity. And so Jesus is praying that for his disciples. He prays for the intense unity of those who follow him. In verse 12, he says, while I was with them, I was keeping them in the name or in thy name, which thou hast given me. And I guarded them and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. So Jesus has been working to diligently keep them. He says, but now I come to thee and these things I speak in the world for that they may have my joy made full in themselves. And so Jesus prays for their unity, but Jesus also prays for their joy. Because Jesus recognizes and is fully aware because of the eternal plan of God what is about to come for the disciples. They've been following, they have believed, they've not gotten it all properly and, and perfectly understood, and they've certainly not gotten it all rightly exercised, but they have followed and they have responded, they have believed who Jesus is, and Jesus realizes that he's about to leave them because he says, I'm coming to the Father, but they're still going to be here, and I've worked diligently while I'm here, so I'm praying for them as they remain that they might be united, and that in the midst of the context that he knows is coming, that they might remain joyful. But he also prays for their purity. And I want us to see three things particularly about their purity. Now, I've given them thy word. Verse 14, I've given them thy word. And the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Just as an aside, the gospel is offensive. And so as we proclaim the good news of the gospel, I say two things. The gospel is offensive enough. We don't have to try to be offensive in, it, in the proclamation of it. But at the same time, we ought to expect that if Jesus was persecuted and the disciples were persecuted because of the good news of the gospel, we should not expect things to be easy as we proclaim it to the world. But as Jesus talks about their purity here, he's talking about, first of all, their doctrinal purity. He says, I have given them thy word. He has taught them truth. He has taught it 
verbally. He has lived it visually. I've given them thy word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. He says, I do not ask that you would take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And so he prays for his followers, sanctify them in truth, for thy word is truth. So there are two things here when we're talking about purity. First of all, when we think about purity, oftentimes we think about behavioral things, but Jesus starts talking about things that he has taught them, truth that he has proclaimed, and he's asking the Father to sanctify them and set them apart in that truth. So he's talking about them believing and understanding what is true. But at the same time, that that believing and understanding what is true also affects the way that, that the disciples and we live. So there is doctrinal purity, but at the same time, that doctrinal purity does shape our behavioral purity. But the third thing that Jesus talks about here is you could call it this, you could call it missional purity. So in the midst of what they have heard and believed and how that is shaping how they live, it is also shaping what they do and where they go. In verse 18, he says, As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. Jesus praying for his disciples in their doctrinal purity, and their behavioral purity, also that they would stay on task as they are being sent into the world. And finally, he not only prays for his disciples here, but he also prays for us. In verse 19, he says, And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. And I do not ask in behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may be one, even as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, and that they also may be in us, that the world may believe that thou didst send me. So he's praying for us, those who would believe on account of their word. That's talking about people that they will physically and verbally and audibly preached to in their lifetime, but also through the recorded words of Scripture, those who had believed down through the generations, believing in Jesus because of the gospel proclamation of these men. And he prays the same thing. He prays for unity, that they may be one, that we would be one. But he also prays for for glory. Look in verse 22. And the glory which thou hast given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be perfected in unity, that the world may know that, that, that you did send me, and did love them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, in order that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for for you did love me before the foundation of the world. There's that reference again, the preexistent Christ. O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known that you did send me. And I have made thy name known to them and will make it known that the love wherewith you did love me may be in them and I in them. Jesus prays for those who will come after. The same thing he prays for these disciples. He prays for those who would believe later. That God would be glorified in them, through them, and to them. And that they may behold his glory. Jesus prays that they would be, that, that his followers would be with him so that we can see his glory. To see him on display. And the reality is, is that Jesus recognizes the mission for which he has been sent. And he says, so I send these. 
that missional mandate, that living as sent people continues generationally for those who follow Christ. That we carry that same mandate of being sent into the world to proclaim the good news of the gospel. As Jesus is praying here for those who would believe later, there are people who right now do not yet believe who will because sent people go and proclaim the good news of Christ to them. Many of you were given on the way in this morning one of these little bracelets. If you got one of those, hold, hold it up there. Let me see your wrist. It's gone. Oh, good, good, most of you. If you didn't get one, we're going to have more of these at the door on the way out because we want you to understand this hashtag that's on it. It's simple, but enormous. On mission. That is part of the identity of the follower of Christ. That we live as missional people. That we live on mission. And we've taken this little reminder as a simple tool to do a couple things. First of all, we want to invite you to wear it specifically this week leading into next Sunday for a few reasons. First of all, that you'll remember that as a follower of Jesus, you're on mission wherever you go. Whether you go to Honduras or whether you go to Detroit or whether you go downtown or whether you go to your neighborhood. If you have lost family members, you may just simply go home. But as a follower of Jesus, everywhere you go, you're on mission. So we want you to, to wear that as a reminder, but also to wear that as a reminder to pray. To pray for yourself. To pray that God would help you be equipped to be ready to present the good news of the gospel as he opens doors of opportunity. Because if God has sent us in the the other part of the equation is that no man comes to the Father unless God draws him. So if he has sent people and is drawing people, God's going to orchestrate places where those people meet up in the same place to have a gospel conversation. And so we want to wear these as reminders that we're living on mission, but also reminders to pray. But specifically at Coolidge Park, we're going to have hopefully thousands of guests that day that probably aren't in one of our services today. And so as we wear these bracelets to Coolidge Park next Sunday, that we have two opportunities. First of all, when you see somebody else with a blue bracelet on, that you pray for that person. That they will begin to understand and, and own the identity of being on mission. So as you see the other blue bracelets to be praying but also when you see someone without one to look for an opportunity for a gospel conversation because that person very well may know Jesus. And if you engage a gospel conversation with a believer, then you have a great opportunity to mutually encourage one another. But if you begin a gospel conversation with someone who doesn't yet know Jesus, you might have the honor of proclaiming to them for the very first time in their understanding the good news that Jesus loves them and they paid the price for their sin that they might receive the gift of eternal life by grace through faith in Jesus. And friends, that's what we want to do right now. I told you we're going to do the invitation a little differently this morning. We're going to have a call to prayer. And I want to invite you, if you'd be willing to come and to pray here at the front, we want to invite you to do that. We're going to pray some for, for some very particular and specific things this morning as we, as we have our time of, of invitation. This is our call to action, is to pray. I never want to come to one of these uh, times on Sunday morning where we don't give people an opportunity to, be, to, accept faith, or to proclaim faith in Jesus. So this morning, if you're here and you don't know Jesus, I want to invite you after our service today. I'm going to be out at the information booth. I would love it if you came by and just simply said, I, I need to know Jesus. We would love to be able to speak with you. 
Or maybe you already know Jesus, but you've never been baptized, and you want to make that commitment this morning. You can do the same thing. Just come talk to us at the information desk. Say, I already know Christ, but I need to be baptized. Or if you have questions about church membership at Stuart Heights, we would love to speak with you. We typically do that in this time, but we're going to do this a bit differently today. So if you'd be willing to come pray here at the front, I want to invite you to go ahead and be moving this way now. Zach's going to come and, and play and, and provide some music for us as we pray. But I'm going to lead us and prompt us through some things to pray about together. Now, I allow you to have time simply to pray uh, quietly. You feel, free, feel free to pray with folks if, if there's a family or people that you know that you're praying for together. We're doing this as community. And, and if you would prefer not to come here to the front, then you can pray right there. You can even kneel where you are. But we want to have a time of, of dedicated and specific prayer for several things dealing with Easter at Coolidge. Then following our, <clears throat> our time of prayer, we've got some announcements and, and information and we'll receive our, our offering and then after that time we'll be sent we don't ever just leave this place we're always being sent and so Father we thank you for giving us this time this morning together to pray And so, friends, as we have this time together, I invite you for the next few minutes to pray for the people that you've identified maybe on your five. We did that a few weeks ago for those that you know that don't know Jesus that you've committed to pray for for this year. Or if you didn't participate in that, but yet you know there are people particularly that don't know Christ, that you need to invite to Easter at Coolidge. So I want to spend a few moments praying for those friends and family members that we know that don't know Jesus. Now, friends, I would invite you to pray for our volunteers that day. All the way from greeters who will hand someone a donut to volunteers who will be pouring out thousands of Easter eggs, not simply to do their task for the day, but to be sensitive to the people around them that may be open to gospel conversations. let's spend a few moments praying for those who may be coming to Easter at Coolidge who have no intention of coming to Easter at Coolidge but merely are coming to the park that day maybe from out of town but praying under the sovereignty of God for those divine connections to take place
Now let's pray for Zach and those who lead in our worship ministry, all of our musicians and choir members that day as they lead in worship and the proclamation of the gospel through music. for Pastor Gary. Father, we lift up our pastor to you. God, I pray that in these days leading up to Easter at Coolidge that you'll give him clarity of thought and sensitivity to your spirit, Lord, as you give him the words that you want proclaimed that day. Lord, we pray for health for him, that you would give him physical strength and endurance and a strong and clear voice to proclaim the good news of Jesus. Lord, for all of the details of the day, for all those who will serve behind the scenes, for those who will get there early and for those who will stay late, Father, we give you thanks. We pray for their care. Lord, for those who will come to hear the good news that day, we pray for those that already know Jesus to rejoice in you for those that are being drawn to you, Lord, to, to run to you. And for, for those who are not even paying any attention to have their sensitivity begun, Lord, as they begin to hear your drawing. Mostly, Father, we give you thanks for Jesus for sending him to rescue us. And we thank you in advance for what you're going to do, for how you're going to glorify yourself in and through and beyond that day. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. We worship you. We rejoice in you. We celebrate you. Now, Lord, through the empowering of your spirit, help us to proclaim you. in all that we do and say. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray together. Amen and amen. Thank you so much.